Good morning. My name is Reverend Paul Maletic, and I have the pleasure of just recently joining our church staff as pastor of Youth and Families, and it's so good to be here even virtually with you and share a word from God with you this morning. Today's scripture reading is a little different. Uh, we are reading from the book of Genesis chapter 27, which might or might not be a familiar story of Jacob and Esau. I will read just the first part of the story and we'll summarize the rest of it. But of course, I invite you to go ahead and dive into the reading the whole thing for yourself after service. Genesis as a whole is filled with such fantastic stories about people and families and how God calls them and uses them and thus gives us pause to think about how God calls us and uses us. I invite you to listen for the word of God from the book of Genesis. Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau went out to the field to hunt game to bring back, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I just heard your father saying to your brother Esau, bring me some game and make me some delicious food so I can eat, and I will bless you in the Lord's presence before I die. Now my son, listen to me, to what I'm telling you to do. Go to the flock and get me two healthy young goats so I can prepare them as the delicious food your father loves. You can bring it to your father, he will eat, and then he will bless you before he dies. Jacob said to his mother, Rebecca, my brother Esau is a hairy man, but I have smooth skin. But if my father touches me and thinks I'm making fun of him, I will be cursed instead of blessed. His mother said to him, your curse will be on me, my son. Just listen to me, go and get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and his mother made the delicious food that his father loved. Rebecca took her older son Esau's favorite clothes that were in the house with her, and she put them on her younger son Jacob. On his arms and smooth neck, she put the hide of the young goats, and the delicious food and the bread she had made she put in her son's hands. Jacob went to his father and said, My father, and he said, I'm here. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I'm Esau, your oldest son. I've made what you've asked me to. Sit up and eat some of the game so you can bless me. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So have you ever mistakenly thought you saw someone you knew? Maybe a friend, a family member, a high school acquaintance. Maybe you've gone up to someone certain, you knew exactly who it was, but then, right, they turn and quickly you realize your mistake. I know sometimes this happens to me when I'm walking in store. Somehow I have one of those faces. People just think, oh, sh this is someone that works here. And, you know, sometimes I go with it. Oh, yeah, down the aisle to the left, go answer their question. Sometimes I'm like, no, I'm not the person. You find who you need to find. Or maybe sometimes it's the other way around. I wonder how many of you have ever been mistaken for someone else. Often we like to play this game of celebrity lookalike sometimes. You know how it goes. You go up to someone and say, wait, wait, wait. You look like, kind of like this person, right? I know over the years I've gotten all sorts of these side comments. I've gotten everything from Patrick Stewart to Vin Diesel Personally, I kind of hope Vin Diesel is a little more accurate, at least looks-wise. But, uh, you know, who can't admit that owning your own starship is great, right? That'd be wonderful. Of course, I'm sure in the weeks I've been here, there are many youth kind of preparing in their minds, deciding who I might really look like. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with our story of mistaken identity in today's scripture Jacob and Esau were brothers, loved by both of their parents. But quickly we see as the story unfolds, Rebecca definitely has a favorite in her son Jacob. Isaac's favorite seems to be Esau as the oldest son. Their father Isaac was older, and as the Bible says, his eyesight was failing, which really meant just there's not much time left. Isaac sent Esau to hunt, make one last meal for him. 
And after that, Isaac would give Esau the family blessing as he was the oldest. But Rebekah had a plan. She wanted Jacob to have a chance to be blessed. Jacob got the meal she prepared knowing exactly what her husband would like. Then Jacob put the goat skins on his arms, his brother's clothes on. So right, this is a lot of pressure and manipulation we see already in this family system. As an aside, I actually love it when the Bible reminds us that dealing with family drama and pressure is not a new thing for people or for God to work through. Not only do the parents here seem not to meet eye to eye on their own ideas for the future for their children, but they are taking it out subtly and maybe not so subtly, manipulating their children to get their own ends. Perhaps this makes you think of spaces and personality conflicts in your own family. I know there's spaces that reminds me of mine. I can't imagine the way that I'm sure this pairing affected Jacob and Esau in either their relationship with each other, how they saw and played with each other throughout the years. I think sometimes because we love our parents, it's sometimes easier to play the role they push us to. But I can't but help but wonder what loss and insecurities were just a part of their normal lives growing up. What could have helped led to this very moment in this story? And right at this point, if you're reading the story, you might be like me wondering, does, does Jacob really want this? Is he really out to get his older brother? Or is he just falling into this family pressure from his mother, her expectations for him? But the moment of truth comes when Jacob walks up to his father Isaac and right has the goat skins and says, it's me, Isaac, and goes on with the lie. Of course, I can't help but wonder then again if Isaac is blind, would he, he should even know, right, the difference between this uneven blind. If you keep reading the story right after we stopped reading in verse 19, Isaac asks again, who is this? Who's before me? And he instructs his son to give him a kiss. And this, for me, just it seems hard to believe that any father, no matter how old, no matter how blind, might be completely fooled into this mistaken identity. Yet it's hard not to blame Jacob, right, for wanting to be someone else. How many younger siblings out there just want to be on top sometimes, just want to be given the same chance to prove yourself as your sibling? Jacob and Esau were twins, and Jacob was named for the way he came out immediately after his brother Esau grasping onto his heel. And this quality of grasping for what's available becomes kind of a part of how others always saw Jacob. Jacob is known as a trickster compared to his brother Esau, who was the huntsman. And perhaps Jacob was just the more creative in figuring out you know, problem solving. If he could figure out an easier way to get what he wanted, then what's the harm? I know a few people like that, always trying to figure out their next scheme. Some might say figure out their next scam. But at some point, others see you coming. Even the most cunning and hope-filled plan can be ignored by others or not even given a chance to be proven. I picture Jacob as someone that didn't like being stuck didn't like being seen as predictable. In this quarantine season, perhaps you too have wanted to be someone else, someone that was not stuck in repetition of what is known, wanting to be anywhere but where you are. There is something lovely at times about wishing we could just dress up in someone else's clothes and take on their lives. How we long at times for the newness that might come with being anybody but who we are. If you could be someone else, who would you be? Yet sometimes we must face the cold, hard truths about ourselves. Perhaps it's fitting that myself as a youth minister, I can remember to this particular struggle with me when I too was a middle school student. 
It was eighth grade year, and for some reason, I decided to join track and field. And personally, I like being active and probably just wanted to do and be what, with everyone, be what everyone, where everyone else was, do what everyone else is doing. But there came a time in our practices uh, after they started that there were tryouts for all the different track events, all the field events. And I, being this naive but hopeful kid, I decided to give just about everything a try. I tried pole vaulting. I tried high jump. I tried long jump. I tried triple jump even. And I can't imagine what the coaches around me were thinking. Uh, perhaps you can't tell by looking me here on camera, but I am not a tall person. <laughs> now rewind to eighth grade year, I was even more not a tall person. I had to have been like this high in eighth grade. And I remember it took there on that triple jump, triple jump after triple jump after triple jump of me trying it with everyone else. And I slowly realized that every place where I looked down and saw where I was in the sand was miles different from where everyone else was jumping. I finally put it together that my short legs didn't equate to being this all-star triple jumper track events were probably not in my future. And it's all good, right? I found other ways to be active. To this day, I love to play soccer, indoor soccer. Though all right, I do realize I'm probably not gonna be drafted by a major league team anytime soon. And while I never had my mom in the ways that we see in our story kind of pave this way for me because of my height, but I have come to terms with that there who would I be if I wasn't who I was? If Without being short, right, there's going to be some things that I'm going to miss out on, some things I'm going to lose. I had to come and realize and come to terms with the losses and the things that I would never have. I had to learn to be comfortable with my own skin, but hopefully through such experiences, I've also learned the strengths and uniqueness that only I can embody. There's, right, there's always something that keeps track of these kind of personal losses and longings for more that we experience. We long for blessings more than that we feel are around us. It's just natural at times. Especially after this time of so much being taken away, it's so easy to discount the blessings that could be right here still with us. What blessings are within our grasp? What grace does God give us that we can cling to to make it from day to day? And I think the closing part of this story helps remind us of a few truths that help better answer these questions. So right, we left Jacob sitting there in his deceit, all dressed up, nowhere to go, wondering what is going to happen. Will his father curse him? Or will he get more than he could imagine? Could he live into the blessing his brother was supposed to get? Could he really live into being someone other than who he's always been known as? And right, his father goes through with it. Isaac blesses the younger son, Jacob, with a full blessing that would be deserving of the older son. Jacob gets so much more than he deserves. Again, I'm not convinced Isaac is fooled through this. But I think it reminds us of a nature of God's grace. Just like what happens in the story, God always gives us more and more and more than we can imagine or we can deserve. Grace, by definition, is that which is freely bestowed. There is nothing that we can do to earn it. But of course, the story doesn't quite end there. Esau, the older brother, gets back from hunting. He prepares the meal exactly as requested, brings it forth to his father, and learns that Jacob has already been through. The trickster again at work, snatching what is available no matter the consequences. Jacob, by wanting something more, inadvertently leans into perhaps the very flaws he was hoping to escape. And of course, Esau is thinking just, what about me? I've done all that was asked of me. Why can I not be blessed? Is there not blessing enough for me? 
right? And then the father turns to him and says, go away, I'm done blessing. No, 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 no. Thankfully, right, that's not how the story ends. In fact, Isaac turns and also blesses Esau, right? It's a different blessing than Jacob. God is definitely a different blessing than Isaac expected to give his older son. But what Esau hoped for in blessing was different than what he got, there, but there was enough blessing to go around. I would beg to say that even Isaac didn't know he had so much blessing to give that day. And so this too reminds us of another fact about what God gives. There is always enough of God's grace. Despite our losses, despite what gets taken away or stolen, there is a never a scarcity when it comes to God's love. God's grace is more than enough for all of us. And so if I think back to that middle school Paul that learned and realized my part in track and field and eventually my own life about what, you know, my losses, you know, being short or other, you know, the list goes on, what that has affected, it would be easy to immediately get hung up and caught on the now and what I can't do, what I'll never be blessed enough to do or to be good enough at. But right, with the wisdom of my years since then, I've realized what a gift being me is. If I was blessed differently, right, I, I have no idea who I would have become. The way God has made me and blessed me has led me to find a passion, right? Right where I'm here at this church for connecting with students, connecting with families, helping them connect with God. The way God has uniquely worked through my life directly correlates to my own comfort with myself and then my own ability to let God work through me, work through the ways that God has chosen to bless me. What blessings lie in us, in all of us, that are just waiting to be discovered or utilized? What grace has God given that we haven't been at a place to hear or receive yet that God is just waiting to transform in our lives? In our current spaces, I feel it's so easy to think in the black and white of what we know, what we expect. We want God to do this. We want God to do that. Instead, I think we need to be ready to see blessings in a new way. God's blessing doesn't change the losses we've experienced. It's not like this Disney classics magic spell, you know, suddenly poof and everything changes. We know we shouldn't expect to pray to God and suddenly be the best at triple jump or even to look like Vin Diesel. But we do know that God's blessing and God's grace indeed transforms us over time. But yet this blessing takes shape different from how we would do it, as it should, right? It's a blessing from God. God's blessing becomes a new reality that we are invited to one step at a time, each day at a time. So my encouragement for us is to be on the lookout for God's grace hiding where we least expect it. Just like Jacob playing dress up, we often first see what hasn't or can't happen our own humanity and our experience of loss gets in the way. Yet when we push away those losses that can so easily take our focus, that can be where God's blessings are waiting to find us. I invite you to pray with me. Dear God, in this space, in this time, Help us be ourselves, our true selves before you. Help us to realize that while sometimes we don't understand the loss, we don't understand what's happened, we don't know what's happened next, but we are thankful for your presence with us, guiding us and pushing us to the new. Be with us now. Give us ears to hear and a heart to be ready for your change in our lives. We pray all this in your son's name.
Amen.